So on behalf of CGD and ECDPM, welcome to the first of our conversation series on the European Financial Architecture for Development, or as it is commonly abbreviated, um, EFAD. So in these conversations, we'll be exploring the discussions, the scenarios, the politics, all around the process to improve and rationalize uh, what is a very complex web of European development finance institutions. Now, this is a process which began around two years ago. Uh, so I'm Michaela Gavas. I'm the co-director of CGD's Europe program, and I'm joined by my co-host, San Bilal. San? Hello. I'm San Bilal. I'm the head of the ECDPM program on trade, investment and finance. And I'm also a member of the coordination group of the OECD Trade Akahana Landed Finance uh, Network, uh, and therefore been involved on the issues of development finance, uh, the effort, uh, and uh, of course, in the context of the COVID-19 crisis, how development finance institutions can respond better to the crisis. Great. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome our very special guest, uh, Thomas Visa. Thomas, who was the former president of the Eurogroup uh, and the EU's uh, European Financial Committee, and crucially chair of the high level group of wise persons on the future of the European financial architecture for development. Thomas, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us for this conversation. Thanks for inviting me. Great. So, Thomas, I, I'd like to start off by taking you back to a key recommendation from the Wise Persons Group report. And that recommendation, and I quote, was a single well-capitalized development entity should become the natural development finance center alongside the European Commission in its role of policy center. So, you were essentially saying that Europe needs its own development bank. And you put forward three options for this. And very crudely put, the first option being the EBRD as the bank. Um, secondly, an entirely new uh, institution. Thirdly, the EIB option. Now, when, when I read your report, I immediately thought that Europe, and, and in fact, the world at large, certainly could do without another development bank. But I did think that Europe, especially having been outflanked by China in Africa, would actually benefit from a single institution. But an institution with real development, uh, development banking expertise, with the know-how, you know, with these things to have real impact. And in the report, you, you even listed the principles of good development banking, including things like development impact, coordination, effective risk management. Now, in my mind, the EBRD came closest to this. So let me ask you, do you think Europe will really be at a disadvantage without its own development bank? And then if you had carte blanche to decide, which option do you think would have been the most optimal? Big questions. And uh, since there is no uh, totally clear cut answer, uh, well, that's the reason why we came up with options. Uh, but we also came up with options because they have an educational value and they show uh, the interested reader what the pros and cons of different possibilities are. And I think it would be very easy to describe what one would be in uh, doing uh, if we were surrounded by enlightened politicians all looking at a blank slate and saying, we've got nothing, but we want to do better in development and development finance, what shall we do? And they would gather around the table and within 10 minutes, they would decide, well, we will set up a development bank for Europe or a European development bank. So whilst there may be a, a large number of enlightened politicians out there, uh, one may have one's views, uh, we definitely do not have a empty uh, landscape. 
Uh, we have the European Investment Bank, which is a very good investment bank. We have, as you said, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which and I've been dealing with these banks for the last 25 years. For me, is the best development bank that we've globally got. And we've got a multitude of national development institutions. Some of them are huge. Uh, some of them are minuscule. Uh, some of them coordinate amongst each other, uh, but they all are national treasures in a way because they either do or pretend to transport uh, national development principles, which should be globally aligned, one hopes, but nevertheless, uh, transport them into countries of operation and plant their small flags, medium-sized flags, large flags, uh, next to each other, and one would hope in a coordinated manner, not coordinated only uh, amongst the European actors, but obviously uh, with all the other institutions uh, that are gathered in potential countries of operation, definitely the World Bank and the African or Asian uh, Development Bank, and uh, the stories uh, that colleagues tell me from how that actually works, uh, shifts from uh, very good in Kenya uh, to deplorably badly uh, in Mali. Uh, so people matter as well. So that's a bit of the background. And when we intensively looked uh, at the respective European institutions, uh, they all very naturally uh, gave a very spirited and, and well thought out uh, uh, lecture and documentation on way, why they should be uh, the European Development Bank. And within our group, I think I can say fairly unanimously, we thought that the European Investment Bank, which was set up for investment projects, infrastructure projects within the European Union, uh, is doing a very, very good job there, but it's not a development bank, uh, by no means. Um, whereas the EBRD is an ex exceedingly good uh, development bank. It was set up, as we all know, uh, to support the transformation process uh, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe and has since morphed into a uh, we should actually probably call it the BEBRD, the Beyond Europe uh, Reconstruction and Development Bank. And uh, it has uh, a mixed ownership, a very large uh, share, not a majority share, but a very large share uh, by non-EU, non-European uh, countries ranging uh, from the US and Canada and Japan, China, uh, African countries of operation, et cetera, et cetera. So very mixed uh, pickles. And uh, that was why we described what would happen if the EIB were to become the European Development Bank, what would happen if the EBRD were to become the European Development Bank. And the, it all had its pros and cons. Uh, and the only perfect solution, which means it won't come about. The only perfect solution uh, is taking the advantages from all sides and setting up something new with one drawback. What do you do with the incumbent? And uh, that is uh, uh, in institutional polygamy is, uh, uh, is, is, is detrimental uh, to the efficiency uh, and mental health uh, of, of actors. So uh, would one then come to the decision that the EIB would focus uh, exclusively uh, on Europe? Uh, they strenuously uh, denied that that would be possible, uh, let alone uh, desirable. Uh, have the EBRD possibly move out of activities uh, in Eastern Europe and focus exclusively uh, on, on Africa and Asia? Other thoughts uh, included by the, the banks included uh, the EBRD becoming the climate bank. Um, 
where do you draw the difference between climate uh, related activities and non climate related activities everything is climate in a way and uh, therefore, one really has to understand that our three options uh, were uh, corner solutions of a triangle. They tried to bring out in an educational manner uh, the pros and cons of very radical uh, uh, suggestions. And therefore, my, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, we will come up with something uh, Politicians will, if they come up with anything, they will come up with something uh, that is uh, none of the above. Can I ask you, why did you think it was important to have a European development bank? Because I mean, in your report, you make the case strongly for development bank, but you don't really articulate why that bank has to be a single European bank. I mean, the EBRD, uh, like the EIB is a multilateral development bank, but this, I mean, the EBRD is a regional bank and there are other regional bank in, in the spectrums of MDBs. So why, why do you think it's so important to have it one as being European? I could either answer as a bureaucrat or I could answer as, uh, as myself. The bureaucrat would say it was our mandate, uh, but that's, uh, let's forget the bureaucrat. Uh, I think the uh, in intrinsic reason uh, was uh, largely the one that Michaela was uh, raising in her initial remarks, uh, that there is a large uh, uh, financial actor out there, China, uh, which is financing projects and raising, putting the Chinese flag on its projects uh, and uh, hopefully uh, the recipient countries are able uh, to repay uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the loans. And if you piece together what the German and the French and the Austrian and the Dutch and the Slovenian uh, and the Danish and the Finnish and the Swedish and the EIB and the EBRD uh, do, it is a lot, uh, but the feeling in political circles was that Europe as a donor, Europe as a whole, is not recognized as an actor in development in a number of uh, recipient, in many of the recipient uh, countries. And so the underlying politics were uh, that quite a number of heads of state or government wanted not only the Chinese flag fluttering over a project, but a European flag fluttering uh, over, over a project, and hopefully more than two chairs available at the opening ceremony. And uh, that, that is the, that is the uh, raison d'etre uh, for, uh, for, for this report. And of course, such an institution uh, can be seen as a center of a web uh, of European institutions. And one shouldn't call it a spider because the spider does nasty things to the things that uh, land in the web. Uh, it would be uh, in the middle of a web of different national institutions and where ideally with the commission as the driver of policies, uh, policies and action would be more aligned, better coordinated than they sometimes have been in the past. So isn't it the Team Europe approach proposed by the Commission, a cheaper uh, way of doing what you intended to do with a, Europe, with a single European Development Bank in trying to branding and coordinating? Is, is that not a more cost-effective manner to achieve what you wanted to achieve? Well, if it's only a matter of branding, uh, then let's go to the printer and uh, get ourselves a, a, a number of stickers and uh, we'll, we'll plaster uh, 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 other continents with a sticker. If you look at uh, what is being done, for example, by the European Investment Bank, they are, they've been financing projects uh, globally uh, for the last decades, but this is more 
uh, similar to export finance. It is always in connection with projects of European uh, exporters or investors, uh, but it is not development finance. So if one wants to use the money that is there, then uh, one needs to have a uh, much greater development focus of the institution so that the projects are not only labeled differently, uh, but have a significantly higher development uh, impact. So uh, let, let's move on a little bit to um, the, the next uh, piece in, in the saga, which uh, was essentially the, um, the feasibility study. So this was a study then commissioned by the European Council, uh, written by independent consultants to assess the feasibility of the EIB and the EBRD as the European Development Bank. Uh, and then they put forward a, a third option, uh, which was the status quo, the, the current situation, with some additional aspects of more collaboration and more cooperation, uh, which was labeled status quo plus. Now, in the working group report, Thomas, you, you said that the status quo was not an option. And yet, it is this very option that has gained most traction. So do you think this is a missed opportunity? Yes. <laughs> um, I think we described fairly well, even if in very polite uh, language, uh, the shortcomings uh, of individual institutions, uh, coordination uh, within the institutions and coordination uh, and policy alignment between institutions. And the reason why we suggested that a feasibility study be undertaken uh, was that even though we were asked uh, to produce a report, uh, we were not given a budget uh, to uh, uh, delve uh, into issues such as being able to cost our proposals. Because for that, you need to dive into the balance sheets of the banks and you need to do a separation uh, uh, accounting exercise <clears throat> and uh, quite a number of other uh, things. Um, and I think the Lamfalusi uh, group of 10 years before us had a budget of, I think, around 2 million euro. And uh, I think we got uh, reimbursed for our uh, travel expenses, but I'm, I'm not quite sure. So, uh, that was why we suggested uh, to have this uh, feasibility report. But one thing uh, was totally clear uh, from all of the assistance that we got from the institutions that some of the members uh, of our group were working in. One thing was totally clear, uh, there is no such thing as a free development lunch. And uh, if you want to set up an institution uh, that works well, uh, it needs to be well capitalized. And uh, therefore, uh, the opinions uh, that uh, the EIB uh, could become the European Develop Development Bank uh, without any additional cost uh, are definitely not borne out uh, by our analysis and our discussions and all the expert advice uh, that we received. Unless the EIB does more development finance from within the existing budget structure, capital structure and institution. And that is something uh, against which everybody whom we consulted strenuously uh, advised. So uh, that may be the reason uh, why the uh, new study, why the feasibility study came up uh, with uh, uh, the status quo and entre parenthes plus. Um, and I guess uh, the plus was added by some people because they were 
uh, slightly embarrassed uh, at coming up with something that is only a bit better than the status quo, which is not good. And others put it in brackets because they hoped that they could retain the status quo. Uh, because for them, the status quo is fine, even though for development, it's lousy. So that is my interpretation of the status quo plus. Um, and uh, many of the things that we uh, put into our report, uh, which analyzed uh, the shortcomings of uh, existing uh, uh, institutional relationships, how director generals within the commission <clears throat> work with each other, how the dialogue uh, between uh, the European institutions and the national development institutions uh, works or doesn't work. Many of, we, we discussed many of these uh, aspects uh, and had quite a number of suggestions uh, on what could be significantly uh, improved. Uh, however, we uh, received, after we published our report, uh, I saw a number of submissions uh, of uh, the institutions and the university uh, uh, claimed that they've done everything anyway, uh, which uh, is probably, it's, it's, it's a miracle. It's a real miracle. So uh, the status quo uh, is uh, a bad option. The status quo is a bad option for development. Uh, it's a good option for those uh, who are living comfortably within the system, uh, but it's a bad option for development. Do you think it's a mistake from the member states? It seems that the council conclusion will, will suggest that there should be a reform of the system, but at no additional cost. Do you think that this principle that there should be no additional cost is a misjudgment by, by the member states? Sounds like a vaccination uh, uh, first discussion on uh, vaccination, doesn't it? Yeah, we want lots of uh, vaccination shots, but at no additional cost. Um, it's it's a sore point in a way, and uh, I've got at least ten different answers. My first answer is uh, that uh, many of these uh, responsibilities lie with finance ministers. Uh, and uh, that's why you will always get uh, the knee-jerk reaction. Uh, we're uh, very much for it, but it shouldn't come at any cost. Uh, ask a finance minister, that's the answer that you get. And that is his or her role in government, in all fairness. Uh, the second issue is uh, that with COVID-19, political priorities have shifted significantly. And had we not had the pandemic and had this uh, feasibility reports uh, uh, surfaced uh, earlier, and a couple of other issues, then possibly uh, one would have been able to generate more enthusiasm uh, for having an intelligent and efficient uh, system of development finance in Europe. I think the interest uh, now in April 2021, May 2021, uh, is significantly lower uh, than it was uh, one and a half, two years ago. Why shouldn't be an, an urgency to, 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 on the contrary, to try to see how Europe could boost its, its response? And, and it seems also from your reports that investing in multilateral development banks and financial institutions would be also, even from a minister's of finance perspective, a very good investment, providing guarantees like the, the e the European Commission is doing with the FSD plus is also seems to be a very effective mechanism. So one would imagine that on the contrary, one would like to boost these kind of elements because they are cost efficient and impactful that will help a global recovery that we also need in Europe. Why do you think then it is more difficult today than it would have been otherwise? Well, one of the advantages of uh, working together in the European Union uh, is that collectively one can achieve much, much more uh, than alone. The sum is much more uh, than the sum of the constituent parts. However, uh, if the vast, if the majority of your time uh, as a, uh, 
let's say, European finance ministers spent uh, in discussing matters of European finance, you do tend to become a bit more inward looking uh, than uh, if you are a separate, totally sovereign uh, uh, state somewhere, somewhere in the world. You have to have much larger antennas on uh, what's happening outside and you much more factor global issues uh, into your domestic policy making, which and I've witnessed this uh, over the decades again and again, uh, one becomes uh, a bit more, let's say even parochial uh, uh, with, with all these discussions. And that is the role then of the European institutions and the large member states who are represented in the G7 or the G20, et cetera, et cetera. They tend always still to have a very global uh, and international uh, outlook. But there, again, you know, elections, um, vaccination problems uh, tend to make one more inward looking uh, and the external aspect tends to be forgotten. But let me add one more uh, financing constraint issue, namely that if uh, one were to uh, build up a well-functioning, either a new development bank or an more much fairly independent subsidiary of the European Investment Bank or what have you not. Uh, it's not done with capitalizing the institution. Uh, development finance is not uh, what the EIB, uh, the standard EIB loan at uh, market rates. Um, who, whom are you talking to? Uh, you're, you're talking to IDA uh, only countries and you have to match IDA uh, conditions. And uh, IDA is, uh, draws its funds uh, from the transfers uh, of member states, uh, a subsidy. So it seems totally clear that if you want to have an ambitious program, the big question also is to what extent, how would you cooperate with the World Bank and IDA? Uh, would you be uh, providing what we were hoping for, would you be providing additional funds to such a European development finance institution beyond what our member states already provide to IDA uh, and, and other institutions uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in terms of their, of their transfers? Or would, and that, is a, that may have been a certain concern on some, would you be cannibalizing uh, development budgets of member states and they would say, okay, so far we've given a billion uh, every three years to IDA. Uh, we will give 500 million in the future because 500 million are being channeled uh, to a European development finance institution. I don't think that's how it would happen, uh, but you have to realize that uh, resources are finite. Uh, there are uh, issues of communicating vessels there um, and without additional money, let me say that again, without additional money, be it for capital, be it for uh, loans uh, that match IDA terms, without ad this additional money, uh, there is no hope that any new or reformed European institution can become a meaningful European uh, development finance actor. Yeah, I mean, just going back to this, um, the, the plus in the status quo uh, plus um, uh, phrase, I mean, this was really about, you know, uh, enhanced cooperation uh, amongst the different uh, European uh, development institutions. But uh, uh, my, one of my colleagues, um, Nancy Lee, she's just written a blog uh, talking about the MD, MDB system. And she puts forward that MDBs were actually set up and that they're judged in a way that strongly weighs against collaboration. So in fact, she's saying that their managements are incentivized to prioritize individual over collective um, MDB performance um, because their performance is principally judged by the volume of, of finance uh, they commit and disperse every year. And, and not by how much space uh, they create for other actors 
uh, to invest. I mean, given this, do you think this enhanced collaboration aspect uh, can, can work? It seems to work fairly well uh, amongst uh, a number of European development finance institutions because they tend to be complementary to each other uh, and co-finance uh, uh, certain projects. What I think many of us would like to see uh, is that uh, project preparation, uh, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, non-financial cooperation uh, with uh, recipient countries. All of this uh, stems, or much of this uh, grows on projects that are structured more at the European level in partner uh, countries. Um, and I think it is natural that institutions think of themselves first and foremost. Um, and I would uh, not expect uh, a large institution such as the World Bank uh, to uh, cooperate in each and every instance uh, in, a, in a manner which uh, opens up spaces for every, everybody else. Uh, that works in paradise. It doesn't work. It doesn't work in, in practice. And there are a huge number uh, of actors. And let's not forget uh, the UN system and uh, all sorts of even sub-regional uh, development uh, institutions. And what we think, I think we can say that over the last 20 years, uh, donor coordination has vastly improved. Uh, when I first entered the business in the, in, in the, in the early 90s, uh, there was huge room for improvement. And I think we've gotten better, or the institutions have gotten uh, better. But what's lacking uh, in Europe uh, is this capacity at the center uh, to, uh, in, a, in, a, in a cooperative process, put together programs and projects into which then institutions from the member states or other institutions uh, can buy into. And that's, that's a missed chance. And that is exactly where uh, the European Investment Bank uh, lacks uh, personnel and uh, it, it lacks a raison d'etre to, to do that. Uh, they were fabulous in financing uh, uh, railways, highways, uh, schools, uh, what, what have you not. Uh, but uh, such, such development capacity, such development capabilities, as we all know, come at a cost. You can't be a lean and mean institution uh, which is able to charge uh, five basis points uh, uh, in, in, in markup because you are, comparatively speaking to your balance sheet size, a very uh, 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 lean staffed institution. You need lots of people with development uh, know-how. Uh, you need to be generously staffed. And this shows either up uh, in the margin that the development bank is charging, the EBRD is not cheap, or it shows up uh, in the necessary subsidies or transfers uh, by owners in order to subsidize down uh, the interest rate uh, that you're charging uh, to, to recipients. So again, free lunch only in paradise. And James Milton wrote about paradise lost. Yes, the, the EIB though has been accused by many of the other financial institutions to uh, uh, to not have uh, uh, market prices and to, to have to subsidize its prices and to have too low prices, which is a recurrent uh, recriminations that come to the EIB, which is in fact a decision by, by the shareholders of the EIB. That means the, the member states. So going more in the direction you are suggesting. Let me perhaps get, uh, get back to the points that you were saying that uh, 
finance uh, ministers tend to, to look at what is happening internally, not enough externally. In, in terms of the way forwards, the, do you think that the, the council and, and the way the, e, the discussion at the European level should be reorganized to some extent that these, the, the economic and finance committee, ECFIN, that is, uh, uh, council that is looking at these financial questions, and then you have in parallel the, the foreign affairs and, and, and development fact dev uh, council that is uh, um, then perhaps uh, coming in. But there is not really an integrated manner, in a structured in a structured manner to look at these issues. Do, do you think that there should be reform, or again, are we hear from the council that there is a decision not to create new bodies and not need to create new mechanisms? So. Uh, should we keep the status quo of ad hoc type of uh, coordination or sh should we be more ambitious in the way we try to, to reconnect this development and finance world, which is perhaps at the heart of uh, some of the elements you're suggesting uh, in your uh, reports? What we uh, see, I think, is not a need for creating any uh, new forum. Uh, but if you uh, reflect on how often European development ministers meet, uh, there is simply not enough political energy there. There is, they don't meet often enough, um, and that is why they don't, uh, they're not able to generate a sense of togetherness, uh, why they do not, uh, I think, adequately generate a feeling that there is a European aspect to development uh, policy and development uh, finance. But to, and, should they meet more with the finance ministers? That's my question, because they, they yeah. do discuss development. Sh should there be a connection between this financial world and, and this uh, development world? Well, I'm not a great, I, I was never a great fan of uh, ministerial meetings where two such bodies uh, meet together, uh, especially in the European Union of 27 member states, that's 54 ministers in a room. Uh, and I tell you, uh, it's not something you want to witness. Uh, everybody feels uh, an urge to talk. That's the main problem. Uh, but maybe not to say very much. So the, the results from such meetings are 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 not interesting. But uh, what we don't have uh, is a well-structured, uh, at fairly short intervals, discussion of development ministers amongst each other. And uh, we have shared responsibilities uh, across the commission as well with uh, development uh, with, I think it's Jutta Urpilainen, and you've got uh, aspects of the external action service, and then uh, you've got uh, DG Near, which uh, has uh, other responsibilities. So uh, it is not that you have the feeling uh, that there is one coherent uh, actor discussing uh, with one other coherent actor. It's a bit disorganized uh, and uh, maybe atomistic, one would say, in, in, in economics. Bringing more order into that, uh, bringing more uh, uh, discussion into that would be one issue. Second issue, uh, if you have a development institution uh, where finance ministers are the governors, that raises questions, of course. It's very difficult for me to discuss that. I've, I was in the finance ministry and uh, I very happily was Austria's vice governor for the World Bank and the African Development Bank and this, that, and the other. Uh, very rewarding experience. Uh, but there are quite a number of development people who say, oh, you can't have the finance minister as a governor of a development uh, institution because think what happens then. They always say yet. Uh, there may be something uh, uh, in that. So if there were to be uh, a separate development finance institution, whether a joint subsidiary of different institutions or what, what have you not, I think it would be good uh, if the governance of that institution uh, were to reflect uh, its raison d'etre, namely development, 
more development than finance. And if you get the governance right, then maybe you get the management right and you put people in there who are able to and willing uh, and mandated to run a development finance institution. And they would hire development specialists and not infrastructure specialists. So I think uh, with, with all of that, uh, you could be considerably better at a certain cost and that is inescapable. Great. Well, Thomas, I'm afraid we've run out of time. I'm sure both San and I would love to sit here with you all afternoon, <laughs> continuing the conversation. Um, can I just say it's been marvelous to have you with us. Um, really uh, stimulating, fascinating conversation, um, certainly for us. Um, and uh, that leaves me to say thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks to you and your colleagues for inviting me. Uh, I have the privilege of retired people of not having to stick to institutional lines to take, uh, which will <laughs> upset some people, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pleasure. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thanks a lot.